Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I have another unique and fantastic lecture from Neville Goddard. This one was delivered on September 26th, 1969. All are men in eternity. What does it mean when Blake says all are men in eternity? Here Neville tries to explain its unique spiritual meaning. All are men in eternity. Blake said, all are men in eternity, rivers, mountains, cities, villages, all are human. And when you enter into their bosoms, you enter into and walk in heavens and earths. As in your own bosom, you walk in heavens and earths, and all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within. In your imagination of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. When you read it, you may ask yourself, what is he talking about? Yet this is the language of the Bible. Biblical language evokes rather than describes. The Bible is talking of another world, of another man, of Jesus Christ. And unless you know something of the experience it tries to express, its language can hardly come alive. So all the places in the Bible are human. Jerusalem becomes a woman descending out of the heaven, adorned like a bride for her husband. Bethlehem becomes the woman out of which God comes. We read in the book of Micah, the fifth chapter, you, O Bethlehem, who are so little to be among the thousands of Judah, from you will come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel. From of old, from ancient times, this one was. Therefore he will be given up until that time when she who is in travail will bring forth. Then we read in the 63rd chapter of Isaiah, O Lord, thou art our Father, our Redeemer. From of old is thy name, 6316. From of old is one buried in man, and that one is called the Father. Here is the Ancient of Days buried in man. You and I are members of a body which shares in this eternal purposed end. There is an end to everything recorded in scripture and it's only man it's all about you but it's the heavenly man the man in you that is called the ancient of days the one that you and I speak of as the Lord Jesus Christ he's buried in you and you like Bethlehem are in labor you are in travail and you're bringing forth the father but you bring him forth as yourself because everything has to be redeemed and there's only one being and it is God the Father. So you're bringing forth out of your own being God the Father, for there's nothing but God the Father. And the day will come you will know how true these words are concerning the mountains, the rivers, the cities, and the villages. You will live in an imaginative world and everything is possible to you, but everything. When you awake, you are the Father, and to imagine is to have it objectively real. I don't care what it is, just to imagine. Your imaginal act becomes an objective fact. You create your entire world, and it is forever and forever, as we are told verse after verse, chapter after chapter throughout the Old Testament. But it is in a language that man finds difficult to understand, for it evokes. So when you read these words, how do you really understand them? Thou, Lord, art in the midst of us, do not let us cease. You read it in the 14th chapter of Jeremiah. Well, what is the Lord in the midst of us? He tells us in that chapter not only that thou, Lord, are in the midst of us, but that thou hast given us thy name. Well, the name is I am. Do not let us cease. Do not take the name from me. How could anyone exist in the name I am be taken from him? If you couldn't say I am, then you wouldn't cease to be. You may not know who you are, and what you are, and where you are, but you still exist. You should suffer from total amnesia and not know where you are, who you are, what you are, but you can't stop knowing that you are, not as long as the faithfulness of God remains. So he remains faithful to his pledge, and as long as he is faithful, you can't cease to be. You simply are, 
and that is God. That, buried in the depth of your own soul, has to come forward. And when it comes forward, you are God. There are plans by which you will know it. You don't boldly claim, I am God, without any assurance that you are. That would be silly. To walk the streets claiming, I am God, not having the plan unfold within you, would be the height of insanity, and they'd put you away. But when you know it, you don't proclaim it to anyone. You simply know it, and you live by it. You know it because he reveals himself in you. And the only way he could reveal himself in you as you is to have what scripture claims to be his son. And when his son stands before you and calls you father, and there is no uncertainty within you as to the relationship between yourself and the one calling you father, and then you know who you are. I have found him, said the Lord. And he said unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Psalms 89, 26. And when this lad stands before you, you know exactly who he is, and you know who you are, and you know the relationship between the two of you. Then and only then do you know that he, the eternal God, who is the father, rose within you, and you are he. Now you tell it, not expecting a hundred percent acceptance, but you tell it, allowing everyone to respond to what you have said. They see your weaknesses, your limitations, and they know that you are weak, that you are limited, but you tell it anyway and allow them to respond. Some will believe it and some will disbelieve it, but it doesn't really matter. You go your way, telling it until the end of your allotted time now, and when you awake, not to continue the journey, you awake as God the Father. For the weaknesses are taken off with the discarding of this garment for the last time. The body of flesh and blood, you've told it to those who have accepted it, and they will prove it in the not distant future. Acceptance on the part will simply begin to stir within them. He who is buried in all, or they could not exist, for he is the I amness of every child born of woman. And when he wakes, he is the ancient of days. Strangely enough, the story is so true. When you read, What you, who know our father Abraham? He said, Before Abraham was, I am. And unless you believe I am, is he, you die in your sins. John 8.58, John 8.24 But you are not yet fifty years old, and you know our father Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. They can't see with mortal eyes the being that you really are. You know that you are the Ancient of Days, whose origin is from of old. It has no beginning, and it has no end. You seem to have begun in time, but you didn't really, because he who buried himself in his creation has no beginning. He is the Melchizedek of Scripture, no father, no mother, no genealogy, no beginning of days, no ending of days. And so here is eternity buried in his creation and waking in his creation. When he wakes in the creation, then you are he, and you have no father, no mother, no beginning, and no end. But because he is a father, you must have a son bearing witness of your fatherhood, and the son stands before you. That son is nothing more and the personification of the whole generations of humanity fused into one single lad. If you took all the generations of men and all of their experiences and fused it into one grand whole, that one grand whole then personified would be the lad David. When you read the scripture, you'll find that his father was called Jess. The word Jess means I am. That's all it means, I am. Then you are told that Jess was advanced in age when David was a lad, as told you in the 17th chapter of the first Samuel. Then the Lord said, and he quotes the words, and the Lord said unto me, said David, thou art my son, today I have begotten thee, Psalms 2.7. So here, the Lord's begotten, which is nothing more than the sum total of all the generations of humanity. And all of their experiences fused into this one grand single whole. And that personified one grand single whole is the lad called David. David one day is going to call you father. 
but not until you have gone through the furnaces. I have tried them in the furnaces of experience. Furnaces, mind you, all these furnaces of affliction. For my sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how shall my name be profaned and my glory be given to another? Isaiah 48.10 He can't give his glory to another. There is only God. So then he buries himself in his creation, and when he rises, he is still God, but enhanced beyond measure by reason of the experiment of becoming his own creation and rising in his creation as himself. And so you and I are brought out individualized, and yet the one being called God. You and I are members of a body which shares in this wonderful grand play, the purposed end of all things, of the rivers, the mountains, the cities, the hills, everything, for it is all humanity. All are men in eternity. So have you ever sat in a chair or reclined on your bed with your eyes shut as in sleep and then see a scene of water? It's unlike the scene of water that you now see in your imagination. Think of a scene of water. Well, you see it in your mind's eye, but I mean to go beyond that and to see it as you would with your mortal eye. And it's just as real, and you can put your mental hand into it, which is a hand that is real and it's wet. You can drink it, you can feel it, and all of this is real. If you enter into that state, you will see it does become very personal. It's very personal and all related to that state will come into being and you'll be living in a world as real as this. That is in store for you. This is your power tomorrow when everything is at your disposal, everything in this world, all based upon your own wonderful human imagination. For that is God. God becomes as I am, taking upon himself all the weaknesses, all the limitations of the flesh, so that I may become as he is. When he awakens within me, I am he and therefore... I will live in my own wonderful imaginative world and everything will be under my control but everything. Everything in my world will be within me to be contacted at will and no one can escape me when I rise within myself as the one who first became me. So this is the story of scripture. We begin to test it while we are here and we test it based upon our needs in this world. So we are up against it and I can't afford it. I don't have the time. I haven't the means, I haven't the know-how, I haven't, well, I could call a thousand reasons why I can't get it. Then suddenly I heard the story that my imagination creates reality. It does? Yes. Well then let me imagine. Is that enough to imagine it? It should be enough. But it takes one element and that element is faith. Can I have faith enough to believe in the reality of my imaginal act? So my imaginal act is that I am the man that I want to be. I firmly believe it. If I've had this experience, and then all I did is wait for it to appear within my world, for that imaginal act has its own appointed hour, and it will ripen, and it will flower. All I have to do is to wait, for it is sure, and it will not be late. Habakkuk 2.3 The link between my imaginal act and its fulfillment is my faith. My faith is nothing more than the subjective appropriation of my objective hope. I hope that it is true. Well, now the link between my subjective imaginal act and the objective hope is faith, and so I walk as though it were true. That's all that I do. I make no effort to make it so. I let it be so, for I am now acting as God, and God said, Let there be light. Let the sun appear. Let the moon appear. Let this appear. He lets it appear after the imaginal act sustained by faith, for without faith it is impossible to bring it to pass. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. So I have faith in the reality of my imaginal act, then it must objectify itself within my world. So to really understand scripture, I must have some knowledge of the experiences that it tries to express because they're not of this world, hasn't a thing to do with this world. It's speaking of a new man, and that new man is the one in you that I'm trying to appeal to that can believe in the reality of an imaginal act. To the outer you, reality is what it can touch, what it can see, what it can hear, all these things based upon the evidence 
of its five senses and based upon reason. But I'm appealing to another man, a new man that is called in scripture Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in you is your own wonderful human imagination. That is Jesus Christ and he's one with the Lord. So he rises in man, he's buried in man. Man is the grave in which he's buried. He will rise in man, not as someone other than man, but as man, because he breaks down that wall of partition between the two. If I speak of he, instantly, I'm implying the existence of two. If I speak of them, at least more than two. I can only speak of one when I say I am. I can't speak of another and still say one. So Christ becomes one and becomes my very self. And how do I know that I am he? Well, all that is recorded in scripture concerning him, I have experienced. Having experienced it, and I'm told in scripture, it has only happened to Jesus Christ, that my rebirth is a result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, if I rose as it is, said he rose from the same grave in which he was buried, and I didn't see another when I rose, and I didn't see another grave, just the one grave which was my own skull, and if I awoke within my skull, and I didn't see another, and who was saying it? I am. And what's his name? I am. Well, I am is not two, I am as one. I experienced it, and it wasn't another. It was my own skull, and that's Golgotha. And I came out in the manner recorded that I would come out. It is said that Bethlehem must bring forth someone for me, one who is to be the ruler in Israel. And the word Israel means a man who rules as God. So here comes a man, I'm a man, and he comes out. Must I now be the one to rule as God? Well, try it. All things are possible to him, and it's an imaginative act. Well, imagine something that at the moment reason denies and your senses deny and see if it works. If it works, then did you not rule as God? For that's how God commands a thing to appear. That's all that you do. Well, then who is he? His origin is from of old, from ancient of days. Well, who is this ancient of days? You're told in the book of Daniel, and there was one, the son of man, the son of man, was brought and presented to the ancient of days, and they became one, the ancient of days, and the son of man. Well, the word translated son of man is the Aramaic for the term I, or one. And that's all that it means. So when in scripture Jesus employs the words son of man to designate his function as the mediator between the world of man and the kingdom of God, it is only the Aramaic for the word I or the word one. So the one called the son of man is one. An individual is brought into the presence of this ancient of days. Now when we read in the book of John, O Holy Father, I have made known unto them my name, the name that thou gavest me. Now may we be kept in thy name, the very name that thou gavest me. Well, that name he tells you now is the name of the Father, O Holy Father, but he now wants something else. May the love with which thou hast loved me be in them and I in them. 1726. Well, he wears the body of love, the Holy Father. So when you step into the presence of the Ancient of Days, he is God in the human form divine, and the human form divine is nothing but love infinite love when he incorporates you into himself by embracing you and you fuse with the one body this one body then you are the ancient of days you feel it though no one with mortal eyes can see it so when you tell the story they will say to you you why you're not yet 50 in the speaker's case they would say why you're not yet 70 and you say you know abraham if i answered before Abraham was, I am, John 8, 58. They would do the same thing and throw at me the facts of life, which are called in scripture stones. So they throw at you the facts. They have your birth certificate, your place of birth, your social, intellectual, and financial background. They have all these things cataloged, so they throw them at you. These are the stones, as you dare to claim that you are known by one who is our forefather, who lived unnumbered centuries ago, and you tell us that he rejoiced that he was to see your day, and he saw it, 
and was glad. John 8.56 But not only that, that you knew him, that you came before him. That doesn't make sense. But here is that which has no origin, burying itself in that which has, and raising that which began in time to its own level, which has no origin. So here we find the story of Nebuchadnezzar, Melchizedek, all woven into one. Here is an insane king, Nebuchadnezzar, like man in this world. Buried within him is that which is now Melchizedek, who has no father, who has no mother, no origin, no beginning in time, no ending in time. And it rises in that which begins in time, but it rises as that and transforms time into eternity. So he brings into the world that which transforms the world that began in time and transforms it into eternity that has no beginning and no end. And this is the coming of the Father. So the finding of the Father is all that is worthwhile finding. What else is worth finding? So you'll find a million dollars. You find all the things in the world that you think so wonderful. All right, maybe they're wonderful for the moment. Maybe you think you need them. But they will come and like everything in the world, it wears out. Money wears out. Everything wears out. Even the very heavens are dissolving. But this cannot dissolve. And that is the Father who was before that the world was. So when he rises in us, then we are God. Even though for a little while, while you're still wearing the garment that is wearing out, it wears out and the world will call you dead. But after he rises in you, you depart this world forever and return to the Father. Then you'll understand the words, I came out from the Father and I've come into the world again. I'm leaving the world and I'm going to the Father. John 16, 28. And now the same one is saying, go to my brothers. Therefore, we do not differ from this one in whom the whole thing took place. These stories took place in the soul of one and was seen and heard only by that one in whom they took place, recorded as told, either as they heard it or in themselves it took place, and they're recording their own experience. So the gospel is only the record of experiences seen and heard in the soul of one and by no one else. So he said, go and tell my brothers, I am ascending unto my father and to their father, unto my God and to their God. John 20:17. There is no other Father but the one Father, and no other God but the one God, and He is in us as our own wonderful imagination. When you say, I am, that's He, there is no other God. But you do not know it until Scripture becomes alive and you fulfill Scripture in yourself. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. As you are told in Scripture, when I come into the world, that's when I begin to awaken in the world. That's coming into the world. I have come only for one purpose, not to change the world. I didn't come to put things right, as the priesthoods would say. I didn't come to make this schoolroom into a home to transform it into some ideal state. No. I leave it as a schoolroom where man is searching for his father. They think they will never find their father, and how long vast and severe this anguish before they find their father was long to tell. Blake, Jerusalem, Plate 73. Who knows? when he will awaken in them. But he will awaken, and when he awakens, they will see the reason behind it all. They will leave it just as it is with no attempt to change it. Let the world think they're going to change it. Every day, politicians think they're going to change it. Others tear it down, and it goes on over and over. Every day, some new one. Tonight in Bolivia, a new one rises, and the crowds will get behind the new junta, and they will think, now here comes our savior. There are only nine such governments in South America tonight, but more and more are getting into the world, all our saviors. Each one turns out to have clay feet like Hitler and Stalin and all these people, but still people will fall for it morning, noon, and night. You can't stop them because you can't stop man dreaming, and man is all imagination because you can't stop him from imagining, and imagining creates reality. He will simply turn everything upside down by his imagining. You can put a stop tonight, as we are trying now to stop cigarettes. They tried to stop alcohol back in 1919, and they did until 1933. In their doing, they brought into our social world billionaires who came right out of the gutter and made billions that they could not declare for taxes. So then, after 14 years, 
of the experiment, they were left with cash, with unnumbered hundreds of millions of dollars that you couldn't touch. The few they got and sent up for avoiding taxes were on some little pittance like Al Capone who made 125 to 130 million dollars net a year through that period. So when they got him on some small little infraction for a few thousand dollars, but what happened to the 130 million a year? It was all there, then funneled with the same mentality into legitimate businesses. And we found in our wonderful cabbage patch, or call it by any other name, all these worms. So the good doers will do it over and over again. And they're going to start now with cigarettes. You'll find instead of receiving six million in taxes from the industry, they'll get no taxes and it'll still be sold. The taxes that should come into the government for they need it will go into the hands of those who will see that you who want a cigarette will get it. Man never learns a lesson. It goes over and over and over. I lived in New York City in those days. I came in 1922 when it was three years old, and I remained there until 52 when I came out here. So I know New York City backwards, and I recall all these places. You can't stop it. Prohibition is stupid. You can educate a man out of a thing, but you can't prohibit it. If I tell you now that I will give you the earth, providing you will not think of a monkey in the next 24 hours, I'll keep my prize. You can't earn the earth. You couldn't possibly do it. So thou shalt not. Will always be broken. Every commandment that is negative will be broken. So you are told in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, and God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. 1132. Now read it. What the Lord God, who is all love, consigned men to disobedience. The very moment I gave you a commandment that was negatively worded, I consigned you to disobedience. And so they are all. There's only one that is not, and that is love thy father and mother. That's the only one of the commandments that is not stated negatively. All the others are stated negatively. Thou shalt not. But everyone has to be broken. Man thinks he is so holy. And all these people who are now against this and that and the other. So you find someone tomorrow who will die. And they'll say, to what do you attribute your longevity? Smoking every day since I was eight. Of course, they won't read that. They'll turn it right over. And then to what do you attribute yours? And she died at 30. I didn't smoke. My mother never smoked in her life. Died at 61. A painful death. Never drank. In her life, my father drank like a fish and died at 85. He broke every law in the world concerning health. Didn't have any health code, never read anything concerning what he should eat in order to live. He just lived and ate what he wanted when he wanted it and drank what he wanted when he wanted it. And at 85, every faculty alive, he died from sheer exhaustion. So I have two examples before me. When they give me all this nonsense about you should eat this and you should do this and all, I don't go for it. I'll wear out this body as I wear out the suit of clothes and one day I'll wear it out and I can't find another one to put on and they'll call me dead. But this time I will not be restored to life as the world will be. I have departed life as the world knows it. I am one with the awakened Lord for I've experienced all the recordings in scripture concerning Jesus Christ. He said, did not David in the spirit call Christ my Lord? Which simply means my father or O Lord, thou art my father. Matthew 22:41, And that is my name. So he called him Lord. And he is giving you a secret. But the Bible evokes, it doesn't describe. Well, there are three kinds of writing, journalism, literature, and scripture, and they differ. So if you want to study journalism, study it. It's marvelous. Study literature, all right. Take the more difficult course and study literature. But you can't study scripture, not in that sense, for it is all revelation it's all vision. It's written differently. And so everything in scripture becomes man. The rivers, the mountains, the cities, the villages, all. Everything is man. Take the fourth chapter of Daniel. And the watchers from above and the watcher came down and I heard the watcher say, I saw this in my vision, said Daniel. And the watcher said, cut down the tree, cut off its branches, strip its leaves and scatter its fruit. But leave the stump and bind it in iron and bronze. And now the tree becomes a person, water him with the dew of heaven, 
and take from him the mind of man and give him the mind of a beast and let his habitation be among the beasts until seven times pass over him. And he learns that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will, even the lowliest among men. Daniel 4.10-17 through 17. So let the tree be completely cut down. Well, the tree grows in the human brain. That's the tree. In the human brain grows the tree of life. But it's been cut down to the root, and now out of the tree of life will come a shoot. Comes right out of Jess, and Jess is I am. That shoot that comes out will now come forth and is what the Father is waiting for. He's waiting for himself to come out of man. When he comes out of man, he brings man with him so that man is individualized forever and forever, but now he is God. He no longer is something that began in time and space that has ceased to be with the arrival of the awakening of God in him. So God who created it all became it all and rising in all rubs away time as we know it and rubs away space as we know it. For now, he is the only reality. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence, followed by question and answers. Now let us go into the silence. Now this lecture doesn't carry any questions or answers, but the one thing I want you to take away from this is understanding spiritual literature like the Bible. You have to read it different. There's a way of reading it. You can read English literature and you'll have one thing, but this is meant to evoke. People treat the Bible as if it's some historical document. It's not. It's meant to bring something out of you and that's why Neville talks about it so much. His own personal journey was influenced heavily by access and understanding these words because it evoked something within him. This is hard to accept or understand. And it's a shame because the world's entire history in many cases has been built around a historical description or understanding of what happened in scripture. Governments have been built, religions have been built, wars have been fought over this understanding of scripture. Neville's primary message was that Jesus will come back, will be resurrected. There will be a second coming of Jesus. And it's not going to be someone out there. It's going to be in here. And he awakens within you. Very interesting. He says, of course, you're insane and walking around saying, I am God, when you don't really know that you, in his particular explanation, get confirmation of this. 
there is a confirmation that occurs in vision and experience as you understand the words of scripture and as you play it out in your life you have visions and experiences that show that you are god not just insanely saying i am god so tell me your favorite parts of this sometimes it's hard to actually discuss a neville goddard lecture because it evokes something in me that words cannot describe it brings something out of me a feeling a vision an idea an understanding and it's beyond discussion there's no way for me to properly discuss why this was so powerful to me i'd love to get your impressions of it you can find all episodes of the reality revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution